Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, I thought today I'd start talking about a little bit about growing a creative company uh, because it might apply to some of the things you're doing. Um, growing the, the company, a little bit of backstory on me, philosophy, and then getting into some of the tricks of the trade of design and some lesson learned along the way. Um, I wanted to start with this image of nests. Um, if I were a bird, I think I would be some bird that would design nests like this. I think they're so amazing. Uh, they represent really pushing material to the limit of its structural integrity. They're beautifully designed for their purpose. Um, they create community. And they're made from materials that are reused, recycled, and whatever's nearby. So a really creative design for a nest. Um, our, I started Studio Gang um, really thinking about how to address some of these major issues that we're facing, climate change, the growth of cities, um, the loss of biodiversity, um, sometimes due to that growth of cities, and also to enhance uh, communities in which we live. Um, and as we've developed as a company, we started to really try to seek out companies, organizations that have some of the same goals. And that's when I really feel like we do our best work. So we've been working, trying to help organizations use design and architecture to make their future more potent, uh, more, more concrete, um, and through identity and through how architecture can help serve um, a company's philosophy. Um, just talking a little bit about one of the examples of where I think we really succeeded in, in doing something like that. Uh, this was a small project at um, the Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago. Uh, they had a 19th century kind of reflecting pond designed for strolling around um, uh, built in 1908, and the, the pool over time had become really uh, polluted um, and, and not in very good shape. And the zoo came to us and said, we want to improve this property, just make it more aesthetically appealing and represent who we are a little bit better. Um, so with a problem like that, um, we really gathered around a number of experts, not just uh, our structural engineers, but also people that dealt with water quality, hydrologists, biologists, and, and, and sat down really early in the process to think about what this pond could be uh, besides improving it aesthetically. Um, and because we started so early in, in the process together with the, the client, um, we really discovered what the potential could be for this pond. Um, so today, it's, it's probably in its fourth year of, of completion. Um, but we really just reimagined the pond altogether and, and um, found out that it could do many more functions than it currently was doing. So um, it's, it was a reflecting pool. But now, um, just with deepening the, 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 the pond from 3 feet to 20 feet, we were able to really improve that water quality, something that, as an architect, I wouldn't have known about, um, but something that really allowed it to become a, a, a functioning infrastructure, a stormwater retention pond, and improve the water quality enough that it could actually be a habitat. So fish could winter over in this place. Um, we also took it off of the uh, city water supply and just are using this uh, runoff water, cleaning it with plants um, to go back into the pond, and at the same time creating a place that's really attractive to people and the, the animals right in the middle of the city. Um, so this is some of the early ideas of, of the structure for a pavilion on the site that would become um, a learning pavilion for, for students. Um, so a lot of the times we, we work with the, the builders and um, testing materials, pushing them to their limits. This is really uh, made of a, a sustainable material, wood, uh, bent in two different directions. That's one of the great things about wood. And it's also embodying all the carbon in it. So we made these prefabricated pieces and brought them to site to create this pavilion. And now it's really starting to uh, function incredibly well, both for people who wander around and, and stroll through it at night, but also have activities there, and also um, attracting animals. So 
it, 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 Lincoln Park Zoo is really becoming more of this zoo without cages where animals come and voluntarily you know, display themselves. So they went from having 40 uh, nesting uh, herons, black crowned night herons here, to 400 pair in those, those years. So it's become pretty um, intense. And then it is also attracting small mammals like these coyotes, of which there are about 2,000 of them now in, in Chicago that are being tracked by researchers to see how they survive in this urban environment. So I think it's really interesting to see how public space and these kind of habitats can come into contact and provide a more rich experience in the city. But it's used for classes, like I said, people use the pavilion for yoga. Um, a lot of the architects like to get married there. <laughs> and, um, um, but also the um, teaching opportunities and teaching kids about ecology are strong. It's also been used for some dance performances. And so it's really become this incredible, attractive, very vibrant space in the city um, and embodying um, a, a lot of the ideas that we've had. Um, after, after winning the MacArthur Fellowship in 2011, it was almost like a, I felt like validated for what we were doing, um, kind of going on the right direction, because our practice is really a little bit expanded outside of what a normal architect does getting into a lot of these areas. And so that, that fellowship really helped me kind of like get the confidence to just keep pushing that um, as well. So with another organization that we are helping to you know, define their future was the Arca Center for Social Justice Leadership at Kalamazoo College. And they, they, they had the problem of not ever, there really isn't a building that's a typology for social justice buildings. I mean, uh, a lot of times social justice happens in hidden places. So we, we recently completed a building for them that we hope will help define who they can become. Um, it's it's um, on this small Kalamazoo campus um, and made with this cordwood masonry. So I'm gonna show you a little clip of how that building um, looks. Social justice and social justice activism seems like it's always happened in invisible places. With this project, I feel like there's an actual building, something that embodies the idea of social justice in every way from its outside to its inside. Results will, we will see, but it, they have a new home. Um, and many of the things that we did in that building were very inventive because we kind of resuscitated this technique um, that we found that had been forgotten and brought the right people together to be able to see if we could make it work for an institution where the building has to actually last 100 years. Um, so um, another thing, I guess, for, for architects, um, 
if you think back, just what we're, what we're doing is really expanding the definition. You know, back in the medieval times, the architect was called a master builder. And at that time, the role was really in, all in one, an architect, designer, a builder, and an engineer in one person. And what we've seen over time is that that, that role has separated out and becomes a series of specialists um, in doing different things, especially through the, up till the Industrial Revolution. Um, this is Corbusier, but at that time, um, all of these different design um, types started spreading and, and shifting off and becoming individual. So now we have not only architects, but theatrical designers, exhibition designers. Um, we have lighting designers. And then in engineering, obviously, we have many different fields of mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, plumbing engineering. And so you would think that um, the architect is naturally a great collaborator um, because we, we actually have to bring all these things together just to make a building happen. But in fact, that's really the problem. It, it, it tends to be um, more of a role of coordination and less about collaboration. So we've become really good at maxing out what collaboration can give you in terms of design ideas and design um, input. Um, now I think you know really a 21st century creative team is is much um, more diverse. It takes all of us uh, working together um, in different teams, um, and that's what we've become really good at forming those teams and creating teams, um, and getting the right people together. So one of the things that I think is important is really just having a diverse group, people with different points of view, because with with architecture, unlike product design, every single building is a unique thing and it, it will be, it's a one-off in a way. So um, this serial project um, quality of architecture requires a, a special attention to forming the team um, and making it, making sure that you get those points of view in there. Um, within the office as well, um, there needs to be a kind of a, a very comfortable and open atmosphere that will allow people to test ideas. Anyone can, can have an idea from the person who's an intern on day one to somebody who's an architect for the last you know, 50 years. So, so we try to create that atmosphere and make it possible to, so people feel comfortable saying their ideas, drawing their ideas, and, and getting them out there. Um, and, and it's a spirit that's really just been um, um, cultured in our office. Um, one project I recently worked on that was a design for um, an exhibition was the um, MoMA project, uh, MoMA Museum of Modern Art. Uh, we designed, uh, um, it was kind of a research study that was shown in the museum called Foreclosed Rehousing the American Dream. And we were um, studying what happened to uh, these inner ring suburbs, early suburbs, um, in light of the foreclosure crisis. And so what for that particular project, it wasn't only the interior team of our office and our ex by extension our professionals, but we really had to decide who we wanted to engage that had special expertise that we didn't have uh, to address a problem as serious as foreclosure. So we're not just thinking about the building, but we're also thinking about the economics of the situation, uh, the situation with, with housing, public housing. Um, and so for that project, um, I gathered a team that included an economist, a researcher, a landscape architect, um, an urban specialist, um, um, a, a housing activist. And, and we specifically came together for this project to, to try to understand the foreclosure. One of the things that we noticed uh, when we started looking at Cicero was that a lot of the bungalows, the little uh, one, the single family homes had many mailboxes on them. So they were with all these names. So we, we thought something was going on with the traditional fabric in the suburb that wasn't the way it was designed in the beginning. Um, and, and it turns out that it really was re a reflection of what had happened in Cicero, this, this inner ring suburb, with 
the, the transformation of the, the family from 20th century family um, to a many more mixed and individuals um, living together, extended families, unrelated adults that come to the city to work. Um, so it was a much different makeup than what we originally thought. Um, and so we wanted to get to the bottom of this and in order to do that, we felt we needed to engage people that really lived there. So in a very careful and respectful way, we found a way to interact with um, residents who had gone through the foreclosure crisis and got their stories. So in a way it was engaging, engaging people that um, beyond the professional circle, but the real people who lived in these homes. And, and one of the things that was really a discovery there was that uh, the city of Cicero had been planning on extending a, a rail line to their suburb to, because they thought that that would solve you know, some of the job losses. Um, but what we found out by interviewing people was really that they were, everybody was working two and three jobs and moving all over in various places around the suburbs, not going to the city center. And so for our proposal, we um, recommended a car share as another way to do a sustainable transportation system as opposed to extending a rail line from the city center. Um, but we wouldn't have known that had we not engaged people. And then for our architectural project, uh, we started to design a, a new kind of building that would allow this flexibility uh, within the building so people could add on rooms when their uh, relatives came to live with them for a while or they could uh, rent a room out to someone else um, if, if they needed to make extra cash. So it was an idea about you know, doing a, a building that would support this um, community in Cicero. Um, another thing that we do in our practice, which I think everybody should do, is, is just make up projects. Um, you know, sometimes clients don't walk in through the door with a project that you want to think about. And, and so um, what we've been doing over, over the years is, is um, as, as a problem begins to show itself, um, we might make that problem a project for ourselves. Um, in this case, we, uh, we, the project really ended up being a book um, and a series of steps that the city could take to improve its waterways. Um, and, and it came about from a number of sessions we had been doing um, on the ecology around the river and the post-industrial river. Um, again, we, we met with a lot of people that were using the river um, and, and found out that even though it is an incredibly dirty river with, with uh, raw sewage being ejected right into it, there are still a lot of people in the uh, public that, that use the river. And so we interviewed them, um, and we also uh, figured out what the engineering problems were um, in terms of this wa waste, treating the, the river like a waste uh, sewage canal. Um, we also had, you know, flooding basements with, with increased um, severe storms through climate change. Uh, we have a, 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 this uh, carp species that's coming up the Mississippi, threatening to get into the Great Lakes. Um, so it's another huge environmental issue, um, the, the bad water quality. But then this other, this great potential of, of, of space that, that could be used that is no longer being used for its industrial purposes. So, so we thought this was like a perfect, the ingredients that make a really interesting project. And, and so we went ahead and um, made this book. Uh, the design that really came out of the book was these steps uh, that we recommended for Chicago to renew the waterway. Um, I should say too that we, I also took this problem to some students at, at Harvard at Graduate School of Design and they um, came up with solutions uh, to these incredibly difficult problems as well. So we, we had a whole uh, a slate of, of solutions uh, that we displayed in, in the book. And I should say that number, the step number, this one here, step number one, was really about increasing the public's access to this waterway. Even though it is dirty, and it is like you don't want to ingest this water, I tell you. <laughs> um, but, but the idea that giving people more access to it would create more stewards for this river, um, and then you know ultimately improve its quality. So that was one of our recommendations. 
Um, and what was really interesting, and as this book came out, and there was some positive movement on the policies about the river, like that this, the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District would have to finally um, disinfect its sewage before putting it into the river, and some other things. And I'm not saying it's because of the book, but the book was timed to be um, released. You know, We collaborated with the NRDC, National Resource Defense Council, and we timed it to release uh, prior to these policy change uh, opportunities. But um, step number one suddenly became a, a, real, uh, a real project for us. Um, um, uh, as our city got new leadership and they were looking for ways to increase access to this river, um, we ended up being kind of the experts at that. Um, and it wasn't, you know, we didn't even know there was a boathouse project in the works, but, but it, it turned out that this was one of the ways that uh, the city and the park district were thinking of, of giving people access to turn this more, this dirty river into a recreational frontier. Um, and then, you know, I'll just tell you quick things about the design. We, we, we really didn't have a lot of time. We, we wanted to get this project going. Uh, they told us they wanted it open in one year. And, and again, it becomes, you know, it's for the, for the city, it is, it's kind of like helping them with their identity. What, what will the city become? So, so we relied on some of our past knowledge of, of this is the Moybridge uh, photos of rowing that around the turn of the century. And we also made some models of rowing. This is, this is the positions of, of an oar during you know, one um, cycle and, and, and started to study those things. And we ended up turning that, that movement into um, the roof form for the building. Um, and, and the benefits of that were to bring light into the, into the shelter. I think we, we are using like 65% less energy than most um, buildings, the typical building in the city. You can see these Clara stories. They allow the sun to come in and warm the slab. So we didn't actually have to use um, um, mechanical systems in this space. This is, this is the boathouse uh, with the team using it. And we also use very straight and rectilinear elements to build the roof. So there's no curved elements, but altogether, because of the, the, um, the change in position, just like with the ore, we got this beautiful warped surface for the ceiling. Um, there's a row tank in there for kids to exercise in, um, in the winter months, at, like now, because it's impossible to go into the river. Um, but it's really become this uh, hub in the community. And they do a lot of programs with vets and kids from all over city that, that learn to row. So this is really a kind of a very strong community building project that came out of the project that we made up, which was the reverse effect book. Um, as, as another technique, I think, for, for designers is really to, um, and, and our office is extremely research focused, um, because we work on these different projects that are completely unique, they might have a different program, they might have a different client and a different site in a different part of the world, we have to really start to understand uh, and get our head around the project. So we, we create a bibliography uh, for every project. And what that does is it allows people who join on the team later, because sometimes a project might take five, six years, they can always go back to that resource, the bibliography, which constantly grows throughout the, the course of the project. And, and they can get access to the initial materials that made us inspired in the first place. And so in a way, I call it just like developing a fluency within our office. But also, a lot of the times, the books are recommended by our, our clients. Uh, and and we, we start to learn how to speak their language. And, and, the, and every, single, every single project is like learning a new language. Um, one project I wanted to go into kind of like the ways, the techniques that we've been using for um, co-creation as well with our projects, um, bringing in that expertise from, from outside. Um, one of the projects is called Northerly Island. It's, it's a 90-acre park um, on, on the shores of Lake Michigan. It was a former airport. Um, and the airport was, was pulled out. And then we won a competition together with a landscape engineering firm to redesign this 
project. So because it's such a public space, you know, before it was a kind of a private airport, and, and we're turning this into a public space, uh, we really wanted to get input from stakeholders. So one of the techniques that we used was uh, uh, doing ch charrettes, which are work sessions with, with uh, various people with different uh, stake in the project. Um, and we, we broke up into teams, and each team had designers on them. And we developed about four schemes together with members of the public to, um, to discuss and talk about. And that really works well with public projects, very necessary actually. What we ended up designing was a place that would be almost like an outpost to the various museums nearby on the museum campus. So we had um, like uh, places for bird watching, places for um, fish to spawn uh, that, that correspond to the, the, the um, shed aquarium, and also stargazing and things like that that kind of related to the Adler Planetarium and of course the, the Field Museum. Um, and then many different activities that, that, all, that on one hand help fund the whole project, um, but on the other hand really get at that, that, that core belief of, of bringing nature into the city and, and increasing biodiversity and then letting that be a learning tool for kids. So they're going to have um, camping there for inner city kids that, that can come right out in the city and, and, and camp overnight. Um, we're going to have a, like a, a sunken ship that we're going to buy online and sink down in there um, for pe for fish. That's actually a, a kind of a great place for fish to spawn, um, and lots of activities as well. Um, one other way that we've been doing it's almost like you have to design the tool to for the, to to enable your your partner, your client, to help to be able to be a designer because many people aren't trained as designer. Uh, this was a in a renovation and a new office for the headquarters for the National Resource Defense Council. And um, there are a bunch of attorneys that usually had their offices closed in with doors. And, and because we were going for a really great you know, sustainability rating, a lead platinum, and also a living building challenge, which is really hard to get, we needed to get everyone out of their offices and out into an open floor. Um, so we realized that this was going to be very hard for the attorneys to, to do, and they knew it was going to be hard. And so um, we didn't want to be the bad guy that said, hey, you guys don't get an office anymore. So we, we brought a tool to them to use, which was basically just this game-like map. Um, and we cut out um, workstations of different sizes. Um, and then we, we literally let them arrange them in the way that they wanted to. Um, and, and what was really interesting about the exercise is they started to understand the trade-offs and the, the things that they were going to, um, the benefits. These are like the different ones. We photographed these at the end, the different ones that, that they, they really came up with. So it was a, a kind of a discovery process. Um, and it, it really helped to facilitate and move the project forward in a way that was beneficial to them and to us. <laughs> Um, another thing is just iterating. You know, th these are models, many different models that we created for um, a creative um, director for a theater who was very concerned about the, the seating and the intimacy of the theater and went over just, you know, another thing is just making, making lots of um, models that people can relate to and connect to. Um, we designed the 82-story tower in Chicago called Aqua, and 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 you know when I got into tall buildings, it was really um, a very different. It's a different kind of design process, uh, very different than what we had done with cultural institutions, and we were excited about the idea of of increasing the density and the footprint in the city. Um, but one of the challenges from a design standpoint it was, you know, how do you know what something's going to look like that's that far away from the ground. So many times we're picking out uh, materials for buildings. You, you, can, you can kind of mock up things and prototype things. But with something that large, um, we had to come up with creative ways to prototype this project. One of the things that we did early on was just model making, not only the building itself, but everything around it, way around it, uh, to find out um, you know, its relationship to its surroundings and its sight lines. 
um, as we got more into it, you know, we really got into working with the, the, the builders and the, and the developer about the means and methods, the, 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 the way that the curvilinear um, floor slabs would be made, because every single floor slab is different to create that kind of wave effect. And in order to do that quickly without using lots of foam and bad materials, we found a steel piece the right thickness that could be reused over and over on, on every floor. Um, but trial and error with these kinds of full-scale mock-ups. I mean, again, as well, you know, with before building that, doing a wind tunnel test, this is up in Canada, there's a giant a facility where you can really start to see um, what the effects of the wind tunnel are. And what was really exciting to find out in our design process was that by varying the floor slabs, slightly every single floor slab, we were able to improve the quality of the space in the outdoor. So in other words, it reduces the wind pressure um, so people can use their terraces more, more days during the year, even though it's freezing Chicago. It, everybody likes to get outside when it's nice. Um, and it's also kind of a, it gave us this social connection between neighbors um, that you normally don't get in a high rise so people can see each other and you know, people started evidently dating and things like that. <laughs> um, um, we have uh, material testing. Um, one, one of the things that you can't get wrong, unlike product testing, in architecture you only have one shot to you know, do it. So you really gotta get the, the, the prototyping as close to the actual as possible. But in our experimentation and where we're trying to think about materials in different ways, um, we do projects that are smaller in scale, like I exhibitions, or I told you about the MoMA exhibition, or this one is at the National, um, the, the, um, National Building Museum, where we were uh, testing a material, taking it to its limit. We wanted to see how thin the marble could be and if it could work in tension. Um, I wouldn't do that with a building, um, but it, with an exhibition, it was really exciting. We used a lot of different technical um, um, discoveries and trial and error to get it to this, this um, place where something like 650 pieces of, of 3 h inch stone hanging from the ceiling of the museum without any structural support or frame. Again, we're working, testing the materials in the engineering lab, pulling it apart. Um, testing different connections. Um, I, I think there is really a connection between how we innovate with material and how we innovate on the scale of the city and, and trying to connect those two ends of the spectrum. Another way is using uh, data. We we've collaborate with um, data analytics firms, to, especially for vi visitor serving um, organizations so that, that we can kind of test our scenarios before going out and building it all the way out. Um, and then finally, I think with, with these ideas about um, creativity, one of, one of the things we've learned along the way is that the client might not always come to you with, with the precise question that the project needs to answer. They, know they, they might know they need a building and they know they need something um, iconic or they know that they need something that, that really is functional. Um, but, but framing the issue, critically thinking about the issue is, is really an important part of design. So w one of the things I'm really excited about right now is working with the National Aquarium in Baltimore um, where they are trying to go from being a kind of visitor serving more entertainment venue to being more of a conservation organization that uses their aquarium to help um, to help emphasize their message. Um, and in doing that, really thinking about the ocean in many different facets has been really exciting for us. Um, you can see there's a little bit of a water <laughs> theme that goes through our work, but water and environment and how those intersect with people and cities is really the, the core. And then um, I thought I'd talk just at the end about the difficulties that, that we've had, you know, in terms of, of growing the company. Um, you know, some people were asking me, uh, like, how big do you want to be? How big do you want your company to be? Um, and as we got bigger and bigger projects, that those are the question. And, and I realized finally, like, that is not a question that I really feel like 
is the question I need to answer. The question I need to answer is how to, we want to, we want to do more impactful work. We want to do more uh, projects that are going to change how we think about the environment. So the question is really how to grow it so that we're able to do that, but to keep um, the things that we feel we are really good at and uh, to keep the the creativity, like a small firm creativity, even though we're growing to a bigger structure. So it was really a kind of a challenge that we've been working on over the last couple years. And we had this very collegial atmosphere in our office. Um, we, we really share information. There's no you know, hoarding of information. We are uh, we like each other. We, we, um, we really get excited about ideas. Um, and so with more and more people, how do you maintain that? I mean, people, we do a lot of things like, you know, we spend a lot of time there. So, you know, we, we do things like these pumpkin carvings and, and many other things, camp, things like that. Um, but what I realized recently is, you know, the growth of us, like th this is, um, all of the firms, all the architecture firms that are in uh, the American Institute of Architects, there's about 17,500 firms. 26% of them are sole practitioners, like one person. I started out that way too. I was one person um, when I started the firm. Um, but we stayed in, in, I guess, like I was there for about a year at one person. And then we moved into this area, which 71% um, of the firms are only two to 49 people. So they're relatively small, and I think they're, most of them are on the smaller end of that. Um, now we're about 80 people, and so we're like moved into this, um, the upper two, three percent. There's only there's only two percent of the firms that are over 50 and less than 100, and there's only one percent of the firms that are over 100. So so it's 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 very interesting, and it's also so we're like seeing that is really giving us um, insight as to what our potential could be now that as we shift into this other area. By the way, about a third of all of the architecture graduates are employed in that uh, from the top 3% of, of the firms, of the large firms. So one thing we've been doing, we continue, we grew our camp. We, we go to camp every year and it's a creativity camp um, and we, we expanded it and it, it's still accommodating us at 80, um, um, and we do different activities and, and different uh, classes together. We try to have fun together. Um, but at the same time, we did have to put structure in place. And so, um, you know, this was really about trying to figure out how people could, you know, be mentored and um, grow within the firm. Um, but it really didn't feel like us. You know, it was like, oh, suddenly we have this pyramid and this hierarchy. Um, and and how, what do we really want that to be? So we, we spent a long time working on that. We, we have a diagram that, that represents our project orientation. So when we work on a project, the project is in the middle and we're all around it. Um, but this one really just wasn't sitting well for us. Um, and so one day as we were just working on this, um, filling it out, I noticed that it actually looked better like this. And, and, and that was a, a kind of an aha moment because for us, it really is about support and growth. This is almost like a tree. Um, and where the ideas are coming in and they are the nutrients and, and they're going out and branching up and each branch um, with people that have been there longer can support and mentor people that are coming in that are new um, up at the top. And the people that are new and up at the top have a chance of becoming a branch and becoming a tree. So I think um, the lesson here is just that even when you have to change your organization to accommodate uh, something like growth, you can still own it. You can still own you know, that growth and make it be what you want it to be. You can design it. And so now our latest iteration is, is really going to be something more like this that we're working on, which is the same thing, only slightly curvier. Um, so with that, um, I want to thank you. And um, ready to take questions. <laughs> Thank you.
I'll throw in the first Okay. So um, obviously space is really important to you. Can you describe the space that you've created in your own firm with this many people to foster this type of creativity and innovation? Okay, the question is really about space and what kind of space are we actually in? What kind of space do we inhabit to foster creativity? Um, and, and I think it's, it's a great question. It's, it's something that we evolved over time. We kind of grew into our space. We started in, in a small end of the office and then in, in the same floor there was a, um, um, a poet society and, and there was a communist bookstore <laughs> um, and, um, and, and there was a ambulance chasing lawyer as well. <laughs> and so, but after we, when we started to grow and, and get space as they moved out, we took over the whole floor and we, what we did was we reused all the materials that were already there. So starting with what's there, these incredible doors that look like um, a detective agency door. And we made walls out of those and we made different rooms for collaboration with different atmospheres. Uh, so there's um, a silver room, an orange room, um, a white room, a room on a garden, a garden space. And, and the teams move in and out of those spaces to collaborate. So, but as we've grown, we've, you know, we're starting to fill in every single uh, space. We've, we've actually got a new building that we're gonna be moving into um, in, in the summer. And so we've had the opportunity to actually plan from scratch what our space will be like. And so what we were decided to do is even to plan in more mobility, in, in the, which has not been done yet for architects. Uh, I, we're usually stuck to our desks and because we have a lot of stuff, um, but we're, we're devising ways to liberate people from their desks and be able to you know, use more mobility for collaboration in many different, even more atmospheres uh, throughout the office. Yes, oh, yes. <laughs> Oh, here, yes. Um, so, I'm just saying the Alpha building design, I think it's very trivial. Um, so, I'm, or, I'm originally from China, and our cities are growing very fast. So, in the past 20 years, there are a lot of skyscrapers, and probably today, in my city, I'm from a city that's adjacent to Hong Kong. So, um, there are probably more skyscrapers under construction than skyscrapers in total in San Francisco. So, um, I'm wondering. Um, since people became more isolated and there are more land being taken up by uh, these huge buildings, uh, the sense of culture and community has uh, started to decline. And the city is trying to figure out a way how to preserve the culture and mm -hmm. how to uh, promote the uh, humanity side. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if you have any insights on that. Yes. Okay, so just quickly um, summarizing your question um, insights about um, high density, tall buildings in big cities, how to make those even more more human and with the loss of community that happens um, when when smaller scale buildings get replaced by tall buildings. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. 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 Yes. And right. And so um, we thought a lot about that too with, when I first got the commission for the Aqua Tower. I, we had never done a, a tower before. And so, um, but I was really excited to, to take that on. The condition in, in a city like Chicago, which is kind of a, like, like a, maybe like a post industrial city um, where people are moving out of the city it had a different significance there. So the, the people that would live there, we found out were people who were, maybe their kids went away to school and they might be coming back downtown for culture. Um, a lot of uh, graduate students that live there and people that work nearby in the, in the loop. Um, so it was a little bit different situation, but we still felt that the, you know, there was something that, that bothered all of us because we, at our office, we like to go outside and step outside in the balcony and, um, and socialize we felt like there's an opportunity to make a more social tall building. And so we, we gravitated toward what the terrace could do um, so that you could step outside and be you know, part of the building and part of the city at the same time and also have these views to other people obliquely, maybe similar to like what it would be like to see someone across the yard and across the fence in your yard, um, instead of going for this total privacy, which is um, you know, what the pressure is to do. Um, and then you know you could see someone without having the five minutes of going down the elevator and going outside. So there was that and also social space on top of the podium part of the building. Um, and the innovation there I think was just like using, convincing everyone that 
it would be to everyone's benefit if we didn't separate the people who own apartments or rent apartments from the people who own their condominiums from the hotel. There's three different uses in there. So we combined all of those into the amenities that are on the roof of the podium. And that has been extremely successful because you know, people are really meet their neighbors. And um, so there's a lot of social space within the building. So I think that's important to consider in, in each place, you know, it's going to be specific, like what were people doing before for community and how can that be translated into this vertical. But the, the importance of going vertical is really, I think, uh, mostly about reducing that carbon footprint, you know, making, making cities more um, um, dense, but at the same time making them livable, you know, and, and improving quality of life instead of sprawling out, you know, across the countryside, which is what has been going on here. So, thank you. You mentioned the, I guess, architects originally were kind of a jack of all trades, and then slowly and increasingly so today, there's more specialization. Um, like specializing in buildings. Um, the, the trend in architecture with, with building information modeling seems to be that in order to effectively use that, you kind of need to bring those parties together in yes. a sentence. Mm -hmm. And even firms are kind of structuring themselves, I think, to, to more so do yeah. that, including more design, construction yeah. engineers. How do you see the industry changing in light of what's ha happening technologically and how people are collaborating? Yeah. That's a great question. How is the industry changing with respect to the specialization given the, the building information modeling software that we're using now as a platform? Um, it's, it's a very positive development, um, the, the, the opportunity to have everybody working on the same model um, is a great it's, it's a great way to bring everyone together. It seems so obvious, but it just hadn't happened until now, you know, and, and even now, sometimes certain parties are not brought into the model or don't want to be part of it. Like oftentimes the builder isn't up to the, that yet. So a lot of the, the knowledge that's built into the model doesn't, you know, get distributed. So, um, but it, it's a great, um, it's a great way to start merging and bridging those gaps between the different specialists. I don't think the specialists are going away, but I do think that the, um, we all will know more about each other's work, and that will improve everybody's work. And and I, I do see blurring of boundaries, um, you know, in, in our firm, but in other firms too, where you you start to, um, you know, get closer to one of those other uh, professions, um, and and start to maybe do something that would have been in their territory, and they might do something that would have been in your territory. So, but the model is a great tool to bring everyone, um, and and get them all focused on on the building as opposed to many of the other things that go on in, in collaborations. So, in the green shirt. Yeah, um, I'm curious how you divide your personal time between uh, like meeting with clients, building relationships, and doing actual architecture and designing buildings. Mm -hmm. Personal time? Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I, yeah, it's, I think it's a very good question. So, you know, that's evolved a little bit too, but um, still at this point in the office, I'm still involved in all the projects. Um, and, and what we've done in our structure is bring up more design principles that are almost like, you know, um, doppelgangers and we can, we can communicate very fluidly um, and they're, you know, excellent designers, and they've been with us a long time. So there's there's a kind of you know ability to spread it out a little bit more. Um, oftentimes, I'll get really involved in a certain phase, um, and then my involvement will be you know more less frequent in other phases, and and maybe get back frequent again during construction things like that. Um, so. Um, still trying to manage that and there isn't a lot of like personal you know personal time there's it's a lot of I do what I love to do and I do it all the time so um, and and I think a lot of us feel like that we have to make ourselves you know take breaks and things like that it that's a nice thing about a creative um, profession or um, occupation is like you, you actually like doing it so much you do. And the other thing I, I would, should mention too on your question is just that we've brought in people to 
um, we've we've started to bring in people that can do take things off of my plate that I used to have to do. So when I first started the company, I was doing the QuickBooks and doing the time, you know, and doing the, I was the tech person setting up the network. And, you know, we would have 15 people suddenly go down on their computers and I would be at a you know, meeting and I, I wouldn't let anyone touch it uh, because I built it. So, and, um, but I got over that and, um, um, and, and now, you know, there's somebody who cares about that as much as I did at one point. And um, as well as financial things and human resource things and things that, so that's actually helped liberate my time and it's also made us a stronger organization. Um, okay. Talk a little bit about your you know, design to work structure. It was yeah. a little complicated since you scaled up. Yeah. Uh, what was another thing that was really complicated scaling up from just yourself to mm. 70, uh, 80 people that you're yeah. right now? Um, I, I think the probably the hardest time was when we were about you know ten people. That that's when you really are doing every single thing. And so, as soon as the pro, what helped us was getting um, a mix of projects, some larger and some you know the small ones sometimes take as many people to do a small project as it does to do a large project. But you don't want to give up the small project because sometimes they're really important to your mission or to um, you know your creative spirit so um, so getting a balance of project was you know getting that first big project because convincing people that you can do it you know I, th I feel like some of half my time is spent convincing people we can do it <laughs> and um, um, so so once you get that balance then then there's more um, cushion to be able to take on projects that might not be profitable or they might be labor intensive um, so, or doing something like the book, which was, you know, there's no paying project. There's no paying client for that. Um, so so it's, it's hard to get the right balance. And it, it actually, it's still hard. It's still hard because you might have some very large projects all at once and then you need that, you're looking for that project that you really, you know, is going to make everything come together and, and other times you have have a bunch of small projects and they take up all, all the people and there's not any profit to cushion everything so so that is still um, that's always the hard part part about architecture and design okay um, let's see I'll go to you now yeah <laughs> talk about building green and sustainability and that's all well and good but at the end of the day architecture firms have to make money I'm curious for a medium-sized architecture firm like yourself can you articulate the business case for building green? Yeah, oh, articulating the building case for uh, designing a green building um, from the architect standpoint or from the owner clients from the architect standpoint. Um, you know, it's it's been. I guess the business case is that um, we want to be the best at what we do, and so to master that is putting us into a category of best. And so doing something like the NRDC, um, where it was the first time it was a living building challenge, in indeed took us a lot more time to do that, to, to figure it out. Um, um, but achieving it then put us just in the, the category that, that can't be, we are the only ones that have done that on a commercial renovation, and that's what we believe in. So I think it's, it's a matter of being... Um, um, excellent, the excellence case, I guess, but it's also a benefit, obviously, for um, all of our clients because they will see the productivity increase in their own uh, workspaces and, and all the things, the benefits that come with like, like a healthy living environment like that. That's kind of the way we've been looking at it. Um, I'm gonna go over there first, so, yeah. <laughs> You talk about your business growing as, as that's happened. I'm sure you're now turning away opportunities and, and clients and projects. How do you determine which projects you're going to take and which ones you are? What are some of the qualifiers that um, take something off the list? Perhaps? Yeah. Um, okay. So we we the question is really yeah the question is really about how do you decide what projects to to take or turn away at this point. Um, and it's true that we do have to make those decisions and we, we meet every week on our projects, um, the opportunities that come through the door and if they meet our, um, you know, our philosophical criteria, um, if, the, if the 
if the client or the partner you know that we will be working with is impressive in their you know their philosophy and if if, if we also take something if we think that we can really um, if it's complex and we think that we can ha actually make it different uh, you know make a difference um, and then yeah like sometimes it's really just the city or the place like we've always wanted to do a project in that city so um, you know it's those sometimes intangible things that help you decide and there are times when you have to turn away something you really want to do just because you've got to make sure that you have the capacity to, to do the projects well so um, yeah, that, that's become a little bit easier, but at first it's very hard to turn away something um, after all the years spent, you know, you know, scraping, buying, getting projects by serially, one by one. Yes? Well, let's see, I have the uh, understanding that it was very difficult during the Great Recession for architects. Yes. How, how did you manage that? How did we manage during the Great Recession, starting in 2008? Um, well, <laughs> um, yes, we basically we had this really great mix of projects. We never went went. You know, there was a big boom with residential projects, like after Aqua, and it was it was built. You know, it was done right before the recession, and just got in under the wire. Um, but there, before that, a lot of architects had had turned their practices to t towards solely doing those because they're very profitable and they, it was a boom. And, but, but I think focusing on that one type of project led a lot of firms to actually have to close their doors. But we had just a really good mix of not, we, we made a lot less money after 2008 for just you know, a number of years. And, but we, the great news was we didn't have to lay anyone off. We, we kept our size solid. We had a little bit of natural attrition there, but but kept solid. And then we used that time to retool some of our things, like improving our, our BIM uh, system, as, uh, software knowledge. And, and we did a lot of um, planning also, like planning for growth, uh, which was good because it took us a long time to figure out how we wanted to grow. And we spent a lot of time thinking about that. And we had different models. All of our planning for growth we did with our office. So it wasn't like a group of, of um, the, the leadership thinking of it and coming and giving it. We, we, had, uh, you know, we had sessions where we would come up with different models from everybody from the, the newest person. And, and we, we tried one out for a while, it didn't quite work. And then we finally, you know, like I said, it made it our own. And, and so we, we managed through that period. I'm sure you'll agree this was totally inspirational. Please join me in thanking Ginny Gang.